Welcome to You Talking to Me. Our guest today is Ska Keller, Vice President of the Greens in the European Parliament. Good morning, Ska. Welcome. Hi, how do you do? The Spitzen candidate process was a bit of a catastrophe in the end, wasn't it? I think it was a great success, actually. I mean, one of the leading candidates has been nominated as Commission President. We'll see next week whether he gets a majority for that in the European Parliament. And the whole process, I think, has moved as a step forward in European democracy. I mean, I was taking part as a Green candidate in that, and I really think it has moved forward the, the European debate, the way how people perceived European elections, but really also democracy in Europe. But at the end of the debate, many people said nobody voted for Jean-Claude Juncker. What's he doing there? Well, he somehow managed to get um, well more votes than anybody else of us. And I have to acknowledge that, even though I would hope it would be different, but it's not. I have to acknowledge that the EPP, the European People's Party, has become the biggest group in the European Parliament. And uh, even though, well, I'm trying to change that in five years again, um, but that's how it is. And that's why Juncker should have the possibility to find a majority. He's coming to our group tomorrow in a public hearing that we're doing with him. And then we'll see how he answers to, to our green demands, to our green uh, vision for Europe and in his priorities that he's been already outlining on the web as well. Well, I do see some differences. So it's still a political process, but he should have the right to, as first, um, try to find a majority in the parliament. Some, uh, not least David Cameron, said this is a bit of a coup by the parliament. That whether you agree with them or not, the process of getting the Spitzen candidate uh, established was a bit clumsy, wasn't it? which can surely be improved. I mean, it was the first time ever this was done and tried, so sure, next time we'll do it better. But to say it's a coup by the parliament is already, I mean, you know, how can the parliament, a directly elected institution in the European Union, um, how can that do a coup? I think it was rather the other way around. The parliament really tried to push forward European democracy, but then Cameron just simply said, I don't care about the election result. And that, I think, would have been a great problem for democracy in Europe if he would have prevailed if we would have won that fight. So I'm very happy he hasn't. And I'm very happy that we have this chance now to also really establish this leading candidate process so that next time it will be even clearer for everybody, including Mr. Cameron, who is going to be the next Commission President. What needs to be improved? Well, I think, for example, Mr. Cameron took, could take part as well in the whole process and nominate, well, not if himself, but his years. group, <laughs> if he's still there, but his political group, uh, which he has split off from the uh, European People's Party, so he didn't have any influence. He could uh, either rejoin the Conservatives or at least have his own or for his own, for his group, his own uh, leading candidate. And uh, I think what can be improved further is that it's like the heads of state, the heads of government make clear beforehand that, of course, whoever's going to win is going to be nominated, no matter, whether, no matter whether it fits their choice or not. And I also think we have to um, improve the European visibility of people. In some national media, for example, the debates weren't, weren't publicized, they weren't shown, and that I think is a big problem. Sometimes debates were reduced to Schulz and Juncker, um, as if the smaller parties wouldn't have a say at all. And then, of course, you end up with two people who basically say the same, who are now forming a sort of grand coalition in the European Parliament already. So I think it needs more diversity, more visibility, but also more commitment from all sides. But also the, the media in general presented uh, Jean-Claude Juncker's performance in the debates as mediocre at best, and, and some were just absolutely damning of his performances, so he, he couldn't care at times. Uh, is this the kind of uh, president of the European Commission that we should see at the end of the, these debates? Well, the thing is, I didn't vote for him, and surely he wasn't our candidate. So yes, indeed, I don't want as such him to be the Commission President, but I have to acknowledge that he won this election. And maybe next time, when uh, the other groups also take their leading uh, candidate process more serious, then they will maybe propose other candidates who are uh, more up to the point. And, uh, but, I mean, they chose Juncker. I wouldn't have, but they did. He had a vote, he won it, and that's what we have to face with. We Greens, we had an open primary process for finding our two leading candidates, which is something I think the other groups might also consider copying. At the end, Jean-Claude Juncker wasn't seen as having performed well, and uh, the process of selecting the candidates wasn't taken so seriously by some of the parties, maybe even by the EPP. Does this damage his presidency from the beginning? 
No, I don't think it damages it at all. I think the whole process has actually strengthened him. And it also has been very clear because, as you say, his performance in the debate wasn't, let's say, brilliant. But I think he's been really taking up that fight, defending the whole process vis-a-vis -vis the heads of state. So I think he's been putting up a good fight there and he's been winning it as it looks now. I mean, we'll vote um, next week. So I think overall the process has been strengthened by the outcome and And I think that was also really necessary because, you know, what are elections for if in the end somebody else completely else decides who's going to win? Do you think that the next election that the council will actually permit this process to go forward? I think they have no chance of getting around that anymore because the parties will set up the leading candidates. They will make very clear for what they're putting up these leading candidates. And uh, so I think really um, we have moved forward a step in Euro -demo European democracy. It cannot be the last step. We need more steps like transnational lists, for example, in order to enhance the European dimension. But we cannot fall back behind this anymore. Okay, so assuming as it looks that uh, Jean-Claude Juncker gets uh, the votes in Parliament next week, what should his priorities be? I think his priority should be as a commission presidency, a president to get Europe out of the crisis, which we're still in the middle of. And he should do so by enforcing social policies, by ending austerity and by really investing into the transformation of the economy and thereby also creating long lasting jobs, jobs for the young people. But do you not think he understands any of those aspects? I uh, would very much hope so, because he's up for the top job in the European Union and that austerity is a problem. I mean, he has mentioned that a couple of times in the debates, and I hope he doesn't forget that all of a sudden. Now, we will certainly remind him of that in our hearing. Let's, let's say he forgets it six months down the line. How does, how does that agenda change? How do you push him back on track? Well, the parliament, of course, has certain possibilities uh, to push a commission in the one or the other direction. We have the hearings with the commissioners uh, coming up where it's very clear how we can make points there. And if you remember five, five years ago, the parliament did use its influence in order to have a change of uh, candidates for, uh, for a commissioner. So it does have a big influence, the European parliament there. But also when it comes to legislation, the commission cannot work without the parliament. The heads of state cannot work without the parliament. So we have plenty plenty of opportunity to remind Juncker and his commissioners all the time about the big problems we still have in Europe, all the big unemployment, the youth unemployment, the social crisis that we have and the many other issues like the climate change talks coming up. When it comes to immigration, Juncker has been like also in the debate saying, yeah, we need legal ways of migration. Congratulations, I want to see that happen. But now in his paper, he already puts back in track like more border protection. I don't yeah, know exactly. what. Exactly. So like the idea that he's going to be able to meet the, the agreements which are set over this week with the priorities with the political groups, it doesn't seem to have uh, much ring of truth about it for the longer term. So do you think Parliament itself will become more aggressive and more activist in its uh, approach with the Commission this term? I would certainly hope so, but we shouldn't forget that Juncker is uh, the EPP candidate and he's following EPP programs. So I'm sure the EPP is going to be very happy with them, with him, and we're not. But we also have possibilities as a smaller group to push the Commission in another direction. So we're not helpless and we can't do anything about it, not at all. And we're going to press as hard as we can for a better Europe. When you say it's, it's an EPP program, really he has uh, just over 200 votes with the uh, EPP itself. So it's a, it's a coalition program at the end. Do you think it'll really look like a coalition program if we looked at it in two years' time? I think it's a very pr interesting program that he has been drawing up. I mean, it's this whatever, a couple of points as his priorities. And yes, some he mentioned some social issues that for sure would resonate with the Social Democrats. Interestingly, he has a whole priority about UK, keeping the UK in, also mentioning the renegotiation of agreements, setting some red lines there, but not very concrete red lines. So it's very interesting how much he's already doing a coalition with Cameron, but of course also with the Social Democrats. His uh, success at this point seems to owe more to the, uh, the participation of the socialists, uh, in uh, particularly Matteo Renzi, uh, perhaps. Do you think that uh, this will be reflected in his program? Well, he needs their support as well. So I think what he currently says or writes about um, about social welfare, about creating jobs, investment, that's supposed to ring in the Social Democrats' ear, let's, 
ears as like something positive. So, but I'm curious to see how he wants to deliver on that and what he's really going to do about austerity. Exactly, in austerity, Angela Merkel has consistently opposed the softening of austerity measures. Matteo Renzi has uh, put it as a precondition for his support uh, for Juncker's presidency and particularly the flexibility uh, on, on the, the national programs as well. Um, how do you see this balance work out? Will he play to Merkel or will he play uh, to Renzi, who really he owes this, this success to at this moment? Yeah, that we really have to see. I'm very curious how it's going to happen. But also Renzi, who was in the parliament last week, he hasn't been clear at all about what he wants. He's been very vague. So I think that Juncker can try to find a middle ground between Merkel and Renzi, because both are not very clear. I mean, when Renzi says simply investment, what sort of investment? When he says flexibility, to what point? And uh, when Merkel says uh, no end to austerity, what sort of this. So I think they leave it very vague, which is not very good for us as parliamentarians because we have a speech there by Renzi where it's nice words and nice rhetorics, but zero content. And how are we supposed to deal with that? I mean, it's it's a very, um, it's a very empty um, speeches that we hear there at the moment. And I hope they're going to flesh out some of this soon. Okay, finally, the, the Greens will not get everything they want uh, in this program, but uh, how will you measure the success of the next commission? What things would you say as a minimum uh, would dictate the success of the next commission? Clearly, that should be social measures like reducing unemployment, especially youth unemployment and ending austerity. Also having successful climate negotiations that are coming up very soon. Doing something about migration. That means possibilities for legal and safe entry of asylum seekers and refugees. Absolutely. But also enabling legal migration for people who are not necessarily looking for asylum. That's something that Juncker has mentioned several times, so I want to see him deliver there. But also, of course, the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership negotiations will be a stumbling block here, so um, which we, we don't want to see it happening because it is really putting at risk our consumer standards, also our right as parliaments to do legislation. And uh, this, I think, are going to be main challenges of the next commission. Scott Keller, thank you so much. Thank you.